Titans, go! To Titan Talk, the Titans podcast, aka the Doom Patrol podcast. I'm Charles Skaggs, back in Doom Manor, ready to talk some Doom Patrol with my favorite co host, everybody's favorite co host, Jesse Jackson. Hi, Jesse. Hello, Charles. Um, are you ready to go to the underground? I am definitely ready to go to the underground. I was ready to, uh, last week to go to the underground. I was, I was born ready. So, um, how about, I hope uh, I hope this is one that you're enthused about talking about because uh, and I am really enthused about this one. I, I continue to just be more and more impressed with this series. Excellent. Um, that's, I that's just a good, that's a good uh, hint there. Yeah, I you know I I really do think that they're treating this first season as a long scale um, pilot yeah, almost introduction to the world. Okay. You know versus the uh, you know, instead of looking for the chief, this is truly we're going to just spend time with these people so we'll get to know them so that we can just go further next uh, season. So, yeah, right. good stuff. Yeah, this was this is obviously a big Crazy Jane episode and also a big Cliff episode. Yes. And um, so obviously they're going to feature throughout the episode because that's pretty much – this episode is it's a cliff and jane cliff and crazy jane spotlight episode absolutely and with the other doom patrol members kind of appearing as a cameo they're not really that important to this one so uh this was a really interesting one to break down which we'll, we'll, we'll cover about but uh i came up with a little breakdown and I actually can have a theme this week i want to talk All about right so we can do that uh quick uh so in general before we get into our our Discussion. What did you think of this story? I really liked it a lot. I um, it, you know, some you know, it's a great series when you say, "Ooh, ooh, these yeah. two are my favorite characters." And then when you go to a different episode that's about other characters, you go, "Ooh, ooh, these are my favorite characters." <laughs> um, but right now, after yes. this episode, Cliff and Jane are my two favorite characters. And to have an episode dedicated just to them is just very, very cool. That is very cool. And um, uh, this is obviously one that I've been enthused about talking about because it was based on one of my favorite issues, if not my favorite issue of Doom Patrol ever, um, a story called Going Underground by Grant Morrison or Richard Case that um, – Debuted in Doom Patrol Volume Two, Number Thirty, way back in 1990. So the story, this concept, is essentially looking like close to now 30 years um, old, if you can believe it. But um, but it, it obviously resonates today, and I thought this was a really good adaptation of that. Yeah. So um, not to get us off track, and, and yes. you can if you. As they say in business world, let's table that. Yes. If need be, depending on your topics. But yeah. um, because we have, I have seen other stories about this kind of background and mm -hmm. the abuse, early childhood abuse leading to problems down the road. So it it wasn't a shock to me. I knew right. this was coming the whole long time, but. Was this when you originally read that? Was that a little more shocking? Were you surprised, or you just kind of he he targeted what he was going to do and then just nailed it on the execution? Well, I, I think when I was reading the comic back in the '90s, um, there was that Morrison. I'm talking about Grant Morrison here. Yes, absolutely. He he 
kind of hinted at certain topics. You knew that Jane was damaged, but right. you didn't. They did. Morrison up until this point hadn't really laid everything out. He kind of hinted here. He kind of hinted there. Mm -hmm. But this issue, issue number thirty, essentially um, just laid all the cards on the table and confirmed your worst fears about what happened to Jane. Yeah. And so, so you kind of. It's not a surprise, but you're still troubled to have your f worst fears realized, I think. Yeah. At least I was, anyway. Okay. Good. So, uh, so, and um, obviously being a comic book, it's, it's much more visual and um, a little bit more surreal. But, uh, but the, the core elements of this story are there. And I, I thought that was, I was very reassured by that. I was hoping, okay. I was hoping, I, you know that once I knew for sure that they were going to adapt that story, I was a little nervous. But uh, based off of what we've seen so far, I was in, I was hopeful that they yeah. would pull it off, and I thought they did. Especially yeah, I Diane, did too. Especially Diane Guerrero, who yes, uh, this is her big spotlight episode, and she did a phenomenal job in this one. I agree. Yeah. Uh, okay, so this episode, Jane Patrol, that we're going to talk about here today. Uh, Doom Patrol episode nine of season one. As we get ever closer, we're close to the uh, two thirds mark here at, in season one. Written by Marcus Dalzine, who co-wrote the previous story, Cult Patrol, which was also based on a Grant Morrison storyline. So he seems to be one of the writers very familiar with Morrison. And so I was kind of glad that he uh, was given this task for this episode. Directed by a new director, Harry Jirgin, Jirgian, and who I've not, whose work I'm not familiar with, but um, but thought he did a decent job here. Um, and uh, let's see, guest cast this week. Uh, obviously, we had a lot of guest cast concerning because we get to see a lot of Jane's personalities from inside her mind. So, just like in the comics, they don't all look like Jane. And and I thought that I obviously since I had yeah. read the comic, right? I Were you I surprised liked by that. The, no, I liked that. I, I thought that was realistic in as much as it can be realistic. But I thought it yeah. was a good a good theory that yes, some of them do, but most of them don't, and um, it made for a great visual of all these different. And I loved how. They, you know, highlighted the person's name. Well, they kind of keep, person keep, it, just, keep it keep it straight for everybody. Yeah, Help. and and that was really well done. Yeah, yeah. And I think you almost had to because there were so many personalities, and you didn't want to get them confused. And um, it kind of helped. Like you, you had seen Jane act as a lot of these personalities, but it kind of like gave you that uh, that connection of, as far as how Jane views them inside her head, which I thought was important. Yeah, I agree. And I liked, um, you know, we've seen, like Hammerhead, yes. we have seen when uh, Hammerhead appears, we get that tattoo that's across the chest. Yes, sir. Yes, yes. Yeah, and so then on Hammerhead's persona in right. Jane's head, uh, there's the tattoo. Same thing. Yeah. With the um, silver to tongue. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so yeah. there's the, there's yeah. that little uh, bit of silver paint around yeah. her her um, chin area. Yeah. yeah. So I I just thought this her was mouth awesome. And chin area. Yeah, like yeah. the goatee area. Uh, um, yeah, I'm, I'm bet um, uh, Ste or Diane Guerrero is happy that she doesn't have to wear a bald cap as Hammerhead during those scenes, because now that they've revealed that Hammerhead is bald. In, mm -hmm. in her person, persona, all she has to do is the tattoo. So I thought that was interesting. Yeah, and she, she, uh, doesn't, she doesn't have um, Stephanie Zajowski's Zajowski's uh, bald head, as apparently she does in real life. Yeah, and I liked um, I liked that not all the um, it, it appears to be at least not all the personas were female, though most of them are. Right. And uh, and it was nice to um, – the time – the the personas we got to spend time with were really interesting, and I'm looking forward to talking about some of them to you. Yeah. Um, the uh, So 
as far as the guest cast, Anna Lore, who Anna Lore, who played Penny Farthing, takes a very predominant role in this one. Uh, like I said, Stephanie Shiz- said Jess, excuse me, Chikowski, I think is how it's pronounced. Chikowski. Uh, she plays Hammerhead. She's been on episodes of Supergirl, where she played a security guard, uh, Bones, and Jane the Virgin. Okay. We got Sky Roberts, who played young Kay Chalice. Uh, once again, Dave McDonald as the v- ultra creepy daddy in the story. Got to see him again. Mm-hmm. Uh, Tara Lee, who played Lucy Fugue, the one with the uh, electrical powers. Um, she's been in episodes of Sleepy Hollow, Ozark, and The Fall with Gillian Anderson, if you remember that series recently. Uh, um, let's see. Chelsea Rivera played Silvertongue. Hannah Aline, Aline played Pretty Polly. And uh, she's been in episodes of The Resident and 24 Legacy. Jackie Goldston was the secretary. She's been in episodes of The Passage, the vampire series that's on Fox recently. Mm -hmm. Uh, Shane Mack played Driller Bill, the kind of uh, – the secondary personality that kind of helps escort uh, Cliff to jail. Uh, She was in – Episodes of Sleepy Hollow and Ozark. So Sleepy Hollow getting a lot of reference in Doom Patrol. Mm-hmm. Uh, actress named Monica Lawrence did The Three Sisters, and she was in episodes of Heroes and The Vampire Diaries. Uh, Leela Owen played young Miranda. Helen Abel as Black Annis, one, another personality I was very excited to finally see on the series. Uh, she's been in episodes of Stranger Things and Orange is the New Black, which also, if you remember, features Diane Guerrero. Uh, we get the return of Tyler Buckingham as Frank, who was in the Paw Patrol series. And, you know, so that we during that flashback scene. So that's probably where you're getting confused that there were male um, personalities. Yeah. Those weren't personalities. That was a memory. OK, but I do think um, I think they're, they're all female. They're all female because remember they make a big deal that the no men are allowed. Okay, got it. Yeah, that makes yeah. sense. Yeah. Um, I also saw, um, you know, I recognize Flick, right? Yeah. That's yeah. the teleporting. Right. Yeah, that was very cool. So nice. And um, uh, Bethany Kasulis uh, did a quick cameo as Jack Straw, the one in the kind of scarecrow-looking personality in the cell alongside Cliff, the one that slips cliff the uh the, the pick I, I to speak, break through yes. the wall yeah yeah mm-hmm. so i just thought i'd mention all those so if you're kind of wondering who played what that's who it is okay um now before we get into our main discussion i want to mention uh we talked i talked about the comic book but i did want to kind of mention a few differences from the comic if you're interested sure all right um uh, so quick differences uh include jane being catatonic when when jane's catatonic at the beginning of the series of the episode um, in the comics, she had previously faced uh, a character known the fifth, as the Fifth Horseman uh, during the Brotherhood of Dada, the first appearance of Mr. Nobody in the comic. And so obviously different reasons why she ends up being catatonic on the show. And on, in the comic, the chief is the one who disconnects Cliff, Cliff's brain from his body and puts him in a, just a, a floating nu- nutrient tank uh, just before Rebus. Uh, a kind of uh, version of Negative Man uh, mm-hmm. acts as that psychic conduit between to put Cliff's brain into or mind into Jane's mind. Okay. So it's a little different there. Uh, and then when Cliff uh, first enters the underground, he doesn't just wake up on the train tracks. In the comics, he kind of falls from far above into like essentially what we see is this kind of um, map of the underground. You know, kind of like mm-hmm. if you've seen if seen the British Underground, uh, they have a map of the various stations. Well, Cliff kind of falls into that, kind of like, you know, something out of like uh, Tron or something, where he's kind of falling and, and lands in that world. And so it's much more, again, much more visual. But obviously, they probably because of the limited budget had to kind of scale that idea back. Sure. sure. And uh, and he and when he arrives, he's still in his robot body, not as Cliff still a human. But uh, it kind of makes more sense that Cliff would kind of view himself as a normal man in in Jane's mind. So that kind of makes sense. Which made Which for did. a very powerful um, self-realization when he 
I'm not a man and embrace yes, the fact yeah, that he was a robot. Yeah, and, yeah. yeah, and we'll talk about that. Yeah. Um, and the one last difference is that uh, Driver 8 is the personality that takes Cliff around through the underground in the comic as opposed to Penny Farthing. So okay. that, I thought that was an interesting twist. Um, I was glad because Penny Farthing had – we've already spent some time with her. Exactly. Um, so it yeah, sense. it made a lot of sense. I really like Driver 8 though. Yeah, that's, um, that's, that's uh, who, who we want to talk about first. OK. So, so I thought since this is all a big Cliff and Jane episode as we get into our main topics, um, I thought it would be good to kind of break it down by the personalities that interact with them. OK. So um, the major ones. And so so my first topic this week, and there is a theme, like I said. OK. And the train conductor says take a drink. Take a break, driver eight. So um, that's a lyric from a song okay. called Driver Eight, okay. I will mention, which is the uh, the song that Grant Morrison named the character after. Oh, so, okay. So we'll, I'll leave that there for now. And uh, so obviously I want to talk about Driver Eight in this segment, uh, along with Cliff and Jane. And um, I also want to talk about Karen in this segment because they're – those are kind of like the first two major personalities that Cliff meets while in the underground. So, so um, Driver Eight is one of the main personalities I've been dying to to meet. Uh, we haven't gotten her until now, um, and we don't really see her in the comic until this story. So, so which makes perfect sense. So, I was very excited by this. So, Jesse, what's your thoughts about the Driver Eight personality and also, uh, more of Karen, kind of picking up from the events of last week. What did you think of that? Um, and we'll talk. We'll also talk about Cliff entering the underground and, and whatnot. Yeah, I. The first thing I thought is, um, what wasn't there a? Um, there was a character and i can't remember which comic where um they they called them like crazy eight or something but it was supposed to be the infinity sign you yeah. know and so I, this well, reminded eight, me of that because yeah. well, it well, is eight turns eight turn sideways is, is, is the infinity, infinity sign symbol yes. and so i thought it was very interesting that um driver eight had it does have it sideways so it's yeah. It's um, you know, and that's and that's as it is in the comic too. Yeah. So yeah. So, so I I like that a lot. Right. Um. I, so I, so what do, what do what do you think? Because this is the kind of the full dis- depiction of the underground. Yeah. So we do kind of see it as a train's like um network. Mm-hmm. And and I, I know you haven't been to Britain. I have. Mm-hmm. So I've been on I've been on the London Underground, and so um. Obviously, Morrison, being a Scottish writer, is very familiar with the London Underground. Yeah. And um, what did you think of this depiction of of, of the what's inside Jane's head? What did, did you did it help kind of give you a, a a good setting for the the way you know with with the idea that um, you know each of the personalities have stations and they get kind of transported up either to the surface or back down. Or whatnot, and Driver Eight is the one who, the one personality that is responsible for that. No, see that that wasn't made very clear to me by the episode at all. Okay. Um, I saw it more as this massive, just um, depository of where everyone, uh, you know, this huge train station. So yeah. I did not think of them each having their own station. I think of them all crowded at Grand Central Station is what it right. came across to me. Okay. And just as they needed, they joined the train, joined the train. I thought that was a really interesting thing. Mm-hmm. And the idea that, um, you know, driver's happy. Right. Um, I, I really like the idea of Jane looking at the emergency brake and going, I wonder what would happen. Mm-hmm. And I would have to fix it. Well, how long? How long would you need me to fix it was a really uh, cool point that it, it was good to see. So it was kind that, of like Driver 8, the, that Driver 8 was willing to work with Jane to, yes. give her, to give her more time for what she needed. Yeah, like it, it, it was good to see that some of the personas are 
actually not anti uh, Jane. Um, they actually work together at times. Right. Uh, while others, you seem that it is a friction relationship all the time. Right. Um, and um, the librarian, or no, the, 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 sec secretary, the secretary. The secretary. Yeah. The whole idea that um, you know she she wants order, and right. if we don't do this, things are going to be happen. Um, right. So yeah, I, I like the idea of the train. Um, the train was pretty run down. Mm -hmm. It wasn't bright or pretty. no. It's not. A, it's not a bright and sunny place inside Jane's yeah. head. No, and and, and, that, and, that, and that's makes perfect sense given her trauma and all the, yeah. the problems that she has. That yeah. it's not going to be this bright sunny place. Yeah, and a lot of graffiti. A lot of just this is this is not a very well maintained. Um, and that makes sense. Her brain, the underground, is not very and it's, well. And it's obviously a little bit creepy, and yes. you know, which it's not a comfortable place. It's you know, it's a yeah. dangerous place. I agree. And um, so, when we're kind of introduced to kind of like right off the bat, we we're kind of introduced to a a, a bunch of personalities. As Karen is dragged back down into the underground by Hammerhead. Yes. And uh, they have a little confrontation. Karen is essentially um, talking about how, you know, like, well, at least I have had love, you know, like that, yeah. um, that um, they get, Karen's very confrontational, especially with Pretty Polly, who she like spits in her face and taunts her by singing. And, you know, she's uh, essentially that um, – we get this kind of – right off the bat, we get this – we see the conflict going on inside Jane's mind among the various personalities, how they're all kind of battling for a little bit of control or at least, you know, they, they – you know, like pe because certain people clash with other people. Uh, Jane has that going on inside her head all the time. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's, it's obviously very uncomfortable, and that's one of the reasons why a lot of the – the personalities, once Jane kind of steps out of the shadows as she's watching all this, uh, they're saying, look, we need you up there. We need you to kind yeah. of keep keep things in order, like you talked about with uh, the secretary and Lucy Few kind of points this out, mm -hmm. uh, that um, you know they feel that uh, they need that primary personality. Yes. Uh, you know, steering the bus, essentially, steering Jane, in control of Jane. And without it, you know, there's just all this – This um, the equilibrium is off, and that, that kind of um, – Lucy Fugue points out that it makes all of them more vulnerable. So uh, Jane says she agrees to go up, but then when she goes – starts going up, she kind of rethinks it, and that's when, when she kind of works with driver A to kind of give herself more time because Jane is not eager about going up. Jane feels that she – Jane's kind of fed up right now. She's she's talking about how she's worried that she can't trust anybody, and she doesn't know who to trust. Yeah, he was um, – she's really going through a lot, mm -hmm. and, and she just doesn't want to be there. Um, no. She just wants to lay in the dark. She and, wants a time know, out essentially. Yeah, exactly. Um, so and yeah. she's looking to escape for a while. She doesn't want to be responsible for all the other personalities. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so I thought that was rather interesting. And in Driver Eight, once Cliff shows up, mm -hmm. um, Driver Eight essentially, and again, this is a, a, a stark contrast from the comics because in the comics, Driver Eight is very helpful to Cliff, very. Um, wants you know nothing more to kind of knows that cliff jane needs cliff yeah and so she's very helpful to him in the comic here she's not she's she tells him you know like hey this is off limits you're not supposed to be here mm -hmm. and you know cliff's just trying to figure this whole thing out because he's now in her mind he now looks like his normal self and um, he's trying to get a handle on where he is and what's going on because it's Cliff. He's always asking what's going on. So Cliff is not the brightest bulb. Right. 
Uh, you well, know, he's a race car driver. He's not a yeah, scientist. So, sharpest yeah. knife in the drawer. And that's yes. been um, – but I do think he's trying to have a good heart. He is trying to be a better person because he knows he was not a very good person when he was when he was a human. Right. So, yeah. Um, and good. he starts off he, he starts off feeling that he's uh, – um, you know, he feels – like he's responsible for Jane's current condition because of when Admiral Whiskers was tinkering around inside his head. Mm-hmm. Um, that uh, you know, he, he's blaming himself. He's like, "This is all my fault. I shouldn't have pushed the therapy." And then Rita's like, "Going, well, no, it was actually the rat that pushed the therapy." You know, and, and it was a great scene where he finally says that to Jane, and Jane's like. Oh, I've been wanting that. I want. No, I haven't. You know, just, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that like, was great. Yes, yeah, exactly. Get over it's more, yourself. It's, it's, more, it's almost more like Cliff. You know, he's trying to apologize to make himself feel better, yes. not because he wants Jane to feel better. And maybe, that, or at least that's maybe that's how Jane views it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I thought that was rather interesting. But but uh, Driver Eight uh, essentially tricks Cliff. Um kind of like leads him to think that she's helping him when in fact uh, she calls Hammerhead and uh, Driller Bill to kind of usher him off to the jail cells and then gives him, you know, flips in the bird as he yes. goes. And uh, poor Cliff ends up uh, in a slammer with Karen and uh, who's also there having a timeout essentially. Mm-hmm. And um, so what did you make of that scene? You know, the, the, them, those two in the cell – so Karen is not – you know, when they talked about it last time, right? Um, Karen is delusional. Yes. You know, she just – oh, me and – you know, she I, I found the, true she love. Lives the, she lives in a fantasy world. And not even um, – And she's like the others. You yeah. know, they, they – uh, they don't know what it's like. They don't know. Yeah. She, you know, like like they're all screwed up. I'm okay. Yeah, I'm I'm perfectly fine. Yeah. Um. So that's they that don't want like to see. Life. Right. Yeah. yeah the, like Jane wants to be the normal one. And you know she's and, like I'm because I I have you know I have true love. Right. You know what what could. What else could what's be wrong? wrong? I mean, there's everything yeah, what's else. Wrong, what's wrong? What's wrong with that? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So, uh, so Cliff eventually gets out of the cell, and that kind of uh, leads us to our second topic that I want okay. to talk about. Uh. So, the second topic is "Can't Get There From Here," which is another song title. Okay. okay. I'll just leave that there. And uh, this is I want to talk about. Obviously, I want to talk about Penny Farthing. Because Penny Farthing interacts both with Cliff and Jane here. Um, obviously, is the one that leads Cliff around through uh, Jane's underground, and also tries to um, talk to Jane in this these very intriguing scenes by this very scenic lake, pond, whatever. And it's a very very peaceful spot that Penny loves to go to. She says it's her favorite memory in the underground. And I want to get your thoughts on Penny interacting with both Cliff and Jane in the story. Um, I love that Penny doesn't stutter um, yeah, except stammer. when she uh, – yeah, yeah, stammer. Yeah. Um, so I thought that was very cool. Um, she I, talks I, about it like that, that was her anxiety. Right. When, you know, that, that brings that out. And you had mentioned um, several episodes ago that the – uh, puzzle pieces would all come clear. Yes. Uh, you you at least assumed there would be a payoff. Right. And and, and there was. Right. Um, a pretty good payoff. I yeah. thought that was really well done. Yeah, we'll, um, talk, we'll talk about that when we talk about yeah. uh, uh, Daddy later in my next yeah. topic. So. Yeah, so it was, um, you know, I really so, liked spending you, time with you, Penny. What, and, yeah, now, yeah. Now Penny kind of takes uh, Cliff around. Yes. And um, through the memories, essentially, after Cliff, you know, breaks through the wall in that cell, um, smashing and finally getting through that, uh, he sees like this memory of Jane and thinks it's Jane. He tries immediately trying to apologize to her, mm-hmm. 
And then Penny shows up and is like, nope, nope, that's nope, a memory. Nope, nope. Yeah. That's not really Jane. It, it is, but it isn't. And so um, Cliff knows Penny from interacting with her. So um, even though she's probably not his favorite personality, he uh, at least tolerates her. And she's the one that kind of escorts him around. To kind of do a shortcut, she cuts through various memories. One of them is like this either like elementary school or junior high, something like that, where we're introduced to Miranda. And Miranda, as you know, as it is in the comics, was essentially the previous primary personality before Jane. Mm -hmm. And apparently, as we're, t we're told, that Miranda essentially couldn't cope with being the primary and essentially destroyed herself in what's known as the well. Yes. And because of that, her station was completely destroyed. And so when, when um, they have to go through it though. And so when Penny Farthing takes Cliff through Miranda station, he makes, she makes him cover his eyes like because it will just completely destroy his mind because it's it's so horrific. Yeah. And when he, we they start going through there, it's, it's this big blinding light, and we see Miranda just yelling, "Shut the door!" Right. And you know, just all terrified. And they go through that. Uh, Cliff kind of glimpses some bodies that have been are hanging up, and they're mutilated, and it's just this very morbid scene. As they pass through, so so we see that yeah Miranda had a station, and so that means because all the, each personality is its own station in the underground subway. Yeah, and you know they're all connected by the 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 train and whatnot, and they get through that, and uh, you know that that ultimately leads Cliff to uh, to Jane. Mm -hmm. And so well, they can talk. So what did you what did you kind of think of, of that the Miranda personality? Um, it it was not very clear, um, at first what it was. Maybe um, it would, maybe yeah. it would seem that way more on a second viewing. Maybe. Yeah. Um. Because you know my first thought is not that Miranda was a previous prime. You know, main, yeah. but this was actually the ultimate first personality. Yes. The the K personality, the true yeah. Jane's original uh, self, is what at first I thought Miranda was. Um, right. And because no, that was a, that was kind of like her first major alternate personality. Yeah, because and then you know you get that after she says, "My name is Miranda. My name is Miranda." Uh, right. And uh, you know you could tell that. Uh, Miranda was a persona, you know, I, this in a healthy way, I've seen this before. Um, I have done my share of telemarketing back when I was younger mm -hmm. and often would people would pick up a different name. They would say, I'm right. Rob. So that way the people being rude to me and hanging the phone, they were doing it to Rob, not. Right. Not John. them. Yeah. They yeah. can do yeah, yeah, exactly. So they and, wouldn't take it personally. Yeah, and it was just kind of a, you know, a, a trick they did to themselves. And um, so this was truly them, you know, Kay trying to protect herself by putting on this Miranda. Um, it's a very disturbing story, and it's – it. Um, I, I really thought they handled – once I understood that Miranda was going away – and I once, yes. you know, why this happened. I thought they did a really good job of showing the 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 damage that this, um, I guess K, you know, yes. that yeah, this person has gone through in all well, the different they, ways. It, yeah, they mentioned that that K essentially hasn't existed or didn't exist, stopped existing as a young child. Yeah, and. It's only that the you know the obviously the trauma happened, the the her personalities fragmented into into sixty four different personalities eventually. Yeah. And um, there's just you know she's essentially broken you know yes. that, that shattered really into all these pieces, 
and then it just so happens that all the pieces kind of they they have this very tenuous coexistence with one another down Absolutely. there in the in the underground. Um, now Penny also tries to counsel Jane a little bit. Jane's trying to hide out. She comes across Jane hiding out in uh, Penny's favorite spot, this lake area, mm-hmm. and it's a very peaceful scene. Um, so, and, but um, but uh, Penny talks about like, hey, did you know someone pulled the emergency brake? And and Jane's yeah. acting all innocent, like, whoa, hey, weird, really? right? Wow, yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, you know that uh, she talks about the others are saying that Jane doesn't want to go back up and be the primary anymore. Mm-hmm. And uh, Jane's kind of asking Penny, interesting. She's like, "Well, um, you know, like what, what, what? You know, she talks about like um, what happens when you're spiraling out of control. Mm-hmm. So we kind of get the insight that Jane just feels like completely lost right now. Yes. And Penny says, "Well, you know, like when I feel like that, I come here." Mm-hmm. And Jane says, well, what happens when that doesn't work anymore? So apparently Jane's still feeling like even though she's here, she still can't find peace. Absolutely. And so this is probably why she's close to essentially doing what Miranda did and why the why the sisters, this kind of um, a more manipulative personality, essentially are trying to steer her toward uh, destruction in the well. And Penny's trying to <laughs> save Jane from that. She, when they confront Jane, she's like, you know, Penny goes, you know, don't do this. You know, they're just trying to, to mess with you. You know that that uh, they're horrible. You know, you don't want to follow. You don't want to listen to them. Yeah, and it's very so what sad. Did you, what, did you think of, what did you think of Penny trying to save Jane from her destroying herself? Well, as I talked about earlier, it was nice to see. Uh, not all of Jane's personalities Persons. are are against her. Right. Some of them are, some of them are, harmful, are some on of them are her side. They they understand yeah. that they're in this together. Others are just they just want the chaos. Yes. They don't care. So yeah. so essentially like Jane has this these just uh what's essentially a self destructive side to her. Yes. And then she has another side that's trying to like going, no, don't do that. Yeah. So absolutely. again, again, more, again, more conflict going on within Jane's brain. And this happened. This is going on all the time. Yeah. I mean, she's Behind always, scene, she's always feeling this conflict. Mm-hmm. And so it's, yeah. uh, so that's why, you know, she lashes out sometimes, sometimes she's all sweet and whatnot. And, uh, just because there's all these different sides of her battling, one another. Yeah, all the time. Yeah. All right. Third and final topic. This is the big one. Okay. Everybody hurts sometimes. Ah, a little REM. Yes. Yeah, so yes. and so yeah. Essentially, this was an REM theme. So we had the song "Driver 8 in topic one. Uh, the song "I Can't Get There from Here" in topic two, and "Everybody Hurts." Mm-hmm. So this is a very REM themed. Obviously, because of the song "Driver 8, Again, this is the, the song "Driver 8, This is that was what Morrison named the Driver Eight persona. After mm-hmm. he's a big REM fan, uh, he used that in, in his Animal Man comic that he wrote, and with a Superman REM Superman song, and mm-hmm. uh, uh, just you know, I, I just seem very, very appropriate for this. So, Good. So everybody hurts. I want to talk about Black Annis. Who's again another big personality I've been waiting to see, and of course Daddy, or at least Jane's uh, um, Kay's memory of Daddy, and who's this very like demonic, horrific monster inside her head that just, um, you know, just is is lurking out of the well and. So the, we we have Jane coming to the well, ready to destroy herself, and Cliff shows up, tries to help her as they battle Daddy in this big climactic scene. So what did you think about that, that um, whole thing? It it's a disturbing story, right? And 
you you know it's a disturbing story when you hear when you see her at the jigsaw puzzle and trying yes. to play and you hear him say we have to hurry before mom comes home right. mommy comes home you're like oh yes uh, you, you, yeah you get you feel like i need a shower to get yes. this filth off of me right uh, yes um it's just it, it is unsettling and, and it's supposed to be it's not you're not you're not supposed to be happy about this this is yeah. a horrific and it's obviously explains why jane is the way she is Mm-hmm. And um, it's basically kind of – without showing it, it's laid out right here. Yeah. That, that, that the, whole me- the whole thing with the puzzles is essentially mm-hmm. Kay's last moment. This is, and it's the when, – when Jane actually sees the young Kay mm-hmm. and she makes this comment, this is where it began, wasn't it? So, and, and so, so, so it's this moment where, like, Jane, or excuse me, Young K is essentially like, like you said, trying to complete her puzzle. She tells her dad, like, look, I'm not finished with my puzzle, mm-hmm. and, and this is essentially the loss of her innocence here, as as her father takes her away. Do you? Uh, so the feeling is that this is to do horrible things to her. The do you is do you feel like this is the first time? He did that, or was it just one of the? Um, it was the straw that broke the camel's back. I kind of view it as the the because I would think the first time would be the most traumatic. Yeah. So, but the way would, the way you said though that K yeah, ended. This, so, yeah. do you think that was just one? And I'm not belittling the one time i'm just yeah, saying right that just that was it was enough i don't that, think it was I, I don't think it was just the one time that happened yeah i don't either but i but i but i think this is the first time it happened and that's when and and that's when k was essentially she ended yeah and yeah. and probably miranda and the and her personality split after this as a way yeah. as a way to cope from the trauma of mm-hmm. what happened that first time i think yeah is that um that Jane, or well, you know, um, Kay, her her personalities split, fragmented, yeah, and uh, as a way to cope with all that, as a coping okay. mechanism, makes sense. It's because you know, it, it disasso- disassociated, and mm-hmm. you know that uh, it's just she was so shattered by this horrific moment. Yeah. Like, hey, you know, my father molested me. Right. And as someone who's very close to someone who had that happen, um, yeah. you know, it, it's it, it's obviously very powerful for me to to see this uh, this horrible mm-hmm. concept. But um, it's also a great moment when at the end of the episode, she Jane stands up to Daddy and tells him off. And so it's so uh, it's that a good is, moment for her. That is a great moment, but then it. It brings back when she still hears his voice. Right. It's because not, he's it's not, gone. not. It's not that. It's, it's not that simple, and it's not that easy. No, it's not to it's, destroy those demons. Right. Exactly. It's just. Yeah. He managed. She managed to fend him off long enough to save Cliff, get him out of there, yes. and um, bring herself back from the, the, the brink, essentially, Absolutely. at the same time. Yeah, um, it was just yeah very. Big. Oh, and did did you notice that the puzzle that Kay was putting together was, was the action the, was the the scenic pond scene? Yes, they did. I thought they did a good job of showing that, of tying it together. That so which, because Jane couldn't remember like okay, well, whose memory is this? Yeah, and which makes sense because Jane isn't Kay. It's right. Kay's memory. Yes, and, and, and it's, so so it's this the last time that she had peace before exactly. this horrific moment. Yes. Absolutely. So it's just it's another big punch in the gut as you're watching this story. Absolutely. And um, so uh, Cliff uh, obviously has to for, before he gets in there to help to try to bring Jane back from going in the well um, and destroying herself. He has to get past Black Annis. Yeah. And Black Annis is essentially the here the this guard this final guard. To um, to make sure nobody gets to this very 
um, deep part of her mind. Mm-hmm. This, the di- you could, Penny earlier had mentioned that like as as deeper as you go, the memories get darker and more dangerous, and so essentially you're descending into yeah. hell here. And so as you, this is essentially as you reach the bottom. Black Annis is that last a guardian there, mm-hmm. and Black Annis, you know, sees Cliff as a human, as a male, and decides, well, you can't pass, and you know she attacks him, yeah, and slashes his face, and in this kind of very cool uh, moment, you know, like Cliff looks up and you see his robot man eye where his human eye used to be, yeah, so you realize that that. The human look was just a a shell over his true robot man self. So what did you think of that? So um, I liked that scene a lot. As I mentioned, I thought that was very cathartic for uh, Cliff to be able to embrace that he's not a man anymore. Right. Right. Um, though, and, use it, and uses that to get past Black Annis. I would argue that I think he's actually finding. While he may not be a man, he's continuing to find his humanity, right? Which is a good thing. Um, I, I, um, I like that. I liked it a lot. Now, I was not, um, I wasn't as impressed with um, that persona. I mean, right. I got that they were the protector and trying to right. do. Um, so, um, I, why did you want to see that persona so much? What well, about it? Did you were so impressed with it from the comic? Well, in the in the comic, it's it's much more visually interesting. Okay. Um, Jane externalizes Black Annis. You know, okay. like you know how Jane physically became Karen or physically yeah. becomes Hammerhead. Right. Um. Jane physically becomes Black Annis in the comic when there's okay. a, a major threat to Jane. Okay. And lashes out this angry personality. So um, it was just kind of like a, a, one of the more important personalities. Okay, and got it. And, and I hadn't seen that character. Now, obviously, Jane hasn't externalized her yet on the show. Right. But, uh, but we kind of see how she is here inside Jane's head. Got it. And so that maybe eventually when we do – see her externalize that persona, it's going to be very, uh, very visually powerful. Got it. Whenever that, that personality manifests physically uh, in the, in the real world. Okay. So we'll, we'll see. So I think it's just something that, you know, like if, if, you know, it's a major personality from the comics and I'd, you know, I was just kind of like glad to see it represented finally here. Cool. Okay. On the, show, on the show. But, Good. um, uh, yeah, not much of a, a very important role, but it kind of like a, a good moment with Cliff. Okay. As he as he realizes that hey, you know, to get through here, I have to be Robot Man, essentially. Okay. Good. And and uh, just I love the fact that um, you know he's there for Jane, talking her down and saying, look, you know, you know, I need you. Uh, you know, like I'm here for you. You know, you don't need to destroy yourself. And um, that uh, you know. They face Daddy together, but then Cliff mm-hmm. ends up getting captured by, you know, like Daddy grabs him and then bites him yeah. in half, and that's the that's the moment that Jane snaps out of it. Yeah, and, and I and like she, and, she, and she's like, you know, she yell lashes out so angrily. She's like, "You destroy everything." Yeah, and I'm not going to let you destroy him because yeah. obviously she cares about him. And I like the idea that. Um... I hate you. She could, like finally yeah. says to her father, "I hate you." Yeah, and I like the idea that um, Jane saved herself. Yeah, she did yes. not need um, big, big brother or Cliff. father figure Cliff to take care of it. You know, she did this herself, and I was right. really, yeah. I, I thought that was an important thing, uh, not just for the story, but for um, the character that right. she should be able to do this herself. It's an important moment for her, yes. Absolutely. Yes. And um, you know, like it may not be the the big breakthrough that Jane needs to kind no. of be, be whole, but right. it is the, enough of a breakthrough to snap her out of her canatonic state. Absolutely. And bring her back. So Absolutely. so so Cliff and Jane return 
and um, they return to the surface. The the negative spirit returns to Larry, and then Cliff wakes up and sees some like lab equipment smashed on the floor. We don't know why. What's what the deal is with that? So I was. What do you, what do you, th- what do you think with that? Because I think that's a tease for another story coming up. So I was a little surprised when I watched uh, the previews for next week. Right. Because um, I assumed next week episode would be everything that happened while Cliff was in with the Jane. Other yeah. Jane. Yeah. Yeah. The and it, it doesn't look like they're paying that off, or maybe yeah. just maybe they're just teasing us with the promos right yeah yeah because that's what i assumed was going to be immediately i thought so i thought so too so i'm kind of you know like cliff's like you know what's the deal here and and yeah. Reed and vic both say in unison long story yeah so the question is what's the story with that so i think that's something something we'll find out later maybe mr nobody had showed up or something who yeah. knows okay uh, we'll find out hopefully um and then Vic asked Cliff what happened in there, mm-hmm. and Cliff's like, "It's not my story." Yeah, and, which I thought good, was well done. But the good thing is that Jane's back, and Cliff thinks she's better. But then we get the little nod that you mentioned that that Jane goes back to her room, and we realize, you know, like he's still there, he's still in her head. Yes, and um, he's not gone. Mm-hmm. So rather disturbing. Yeah, absolutely. But but, but uh, important. So so obviously this was a big episode. It was. And uh, do you feel like you know Jane a little better after I watching do. this episode? I do. So, I, more, I very more sympath- much think more, that. More, more sympathetic for Jane? Well, I always was sympathetic for Jane, so I don't think more sympathetic. Um, I think I under, have more you, understanding of her. Yeah. Yeah, but no, so, I've do, always – do you understand why I thought this would be a very important story? Yes, and and I agree it is. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. yeah it's a, it's a, it's a and I definitely recommend reading the comic. If you really enjoyed this one, you should read Doom Patrol volume 2 number 30 from 1990. I definitely recommend okay. it. Going underground. Check it out. It's and you great. said it's one of your favorite comics of all yes. time. Yes. Yes, it is one of my all-time favorite comics. Good. So, okay. it's only one one issue. It's a perfect one issue story. And uh highly recommend it. Very so, nice. Cool. Uh, very cool. All right. Uh, so do you have any favorite lines of the episode? I do not. Um, I was paying a lot of attention to the story itself, but I knew you would carry my – you would do my heavy lifting as <laughs> all right. always. All right. I see how it is. Okay. That's all right. I don't mind doing my fair share here. All right. Uh, favorite lines early on, uh, Cliff and Rita talking, um, where Cliff's blaming himself. He goes – this is all my fault. I never should have pushed us into therapy. And Rita goes, um, well, don't flatter yourself, Cliff. Therapy was the rat's idea. <laughs> yeah, I, I like that a lot because um, Cliff is taking himself a little too serious. Yeah. You know, and kind of um, blaming himself like, oh, right. it's all my fault. And just her – Popping his but, balloon was really well done. Well, I think it's a lot of it stems from the fact that he feels guilty over his what he did with his wife, cheating on his wife, and absolutely, and murdering her, and he thought murdering his daughter until he found out that she was still alive. Right. And um, I don't know if I'd use murder. Well, I mean, you know what I mean. It killed, yeah, accidentally yeah, killed, he accidentally yes. killing him. Yes. Accidentally, I don't think. Yeah, I don't think it was intentional. You're right. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you're absolutely right about that. Intent. Yes. Unintentionally murdering, yes, or unintentionally, absolutely. it was manslaughtering essentially. Yes, yes, unintentionally. Um, I like the line between Vic and Larry uh, before Larry, Larry's negative spirit comes out. He goes, Vic goes. Part of me wishes that we could just shrink ourselves, magic bus, magic school bus style, and get inside her head. And he kind of looks at the others who are staring at him, going, "What?" And Larry says. I'm just marveling at your embrace of the weird and utterly impossible. And then, of course, what a payoff. Negative spirit like, oh, you mean like yeah. this? That yeah, was exactly. awesome. Yeah, it just pops out of nowhere. So, yeah. yeah, Magic School Bus, for those not familiar, was this is this kid show that uh, you it was an animated show. And, like, they would teach you stuff by, like, having this Magic School Bus that could go anywhere, even including inside people's brains or whatnot. So I think that's obviously where the reference comes from. Yeah, I would have used the um, as a 
Isaac Asimov Fantastic Voyage, uh, you know, the old movie uh, where uh, I think that's what I would have done. But yes, fair enough. Yeah. Um, the, uh, there was a line between Penny Farthing and Jane where they're talking about uh, – Penny Farthing's talking, trying to warn her about the, uh, the sisters. Mm-hmm. And Penny Farthing goes, they, she, whatever that thing is in there, mm-hmm. it's nutters. And Jane goes, goodbye, Penny. And Penny yes. responds, the well, seriously, was Russian roulette not an option? Yeah, that was a great line. I agree. Yeah. And then, of course, the uh, the final uh, – the Cliff's last line in the episode, which I thought was really powerful. Uh, Vic goes in there, asks, what happened in there? And Cliff says, that's not my story to tell. Yes. Because it's not. It's not his – it's no, Jane's. No, it isn't. If Jane wants people to know, Jane should tell the story. Absolutely. And it's, and it's good of Cliff to realize that and respect it. I agree. Very important. So so Cliff's making some progress here too. He's, you know, therapy. So, yeah. He's, yes, exactly. Uh, he's, doing good. he's doing good. So what's your rating for this one? You know, this was another good one. Um, I, I've been so happy with this uh, this season and, and the story they're telling. Um I, you know, I'm going to give it another nine. I'm going to give it, okay. you know, nine out of ten jigsaw pieces. Yeah. Um, I, I just think this is, um, I think they're telling the story they want to tell, and I'm enjoying the story a lot. I, I've, you know, I've never been, um, I know one of your concerns is it's not really moving the story. Right. But I, I just don't think that's what they're trying to do right now. No. And, uh, you know, this is, uh, yeah, a really good story. So, yeah, I totally agree. Yeah. All right. Um, my rating, mm-hmm. uh, after uh, everything I just talked about, you probably – probably not much of a shock to find out that I'm giving this one the first 10 out of 10. Uh, I give it 10 out of 10 underground train cars. I, I would have been disappointed if it wasn't a 10. Yeah. Uh, uh, because this is, if this is uh, – you know, there is something beautiful about seeing – one of your favorite stories and having it just nail it. Right. You know, you're like, oh, this was just great. So, yeah, yeah good stuff. They, um, you know, obviously I was very nervous about watching this episode, but they, you know, kudos to the writers and obviously to Diane Guerrero and, 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 um, which also talk about, uh, that, um, you know, the, uh, the guy that plays Cliff, I'm blanking on his name. I can't believe this right Brendan, now. Brendan, yeah. Brendan Fraser, thank yeah. you. Yes, Brendan Fraser um, did a really good job. How great was it to see Brendan Fraser throughout the entire episode? Yeah, and you know he's um, he's a really um, you know he's he's a good actor and he's done a lot of different roles. And right. He's really done a great job on this. Yeah, I yes. really think so. Yeah. Yeah, it seems like it seems like this character, uh, he he cl- gets this character. Yeah, I uh, agree. It, it's not like a performance to him. It's it seems it's very flows very naturally. I think I agree. Whether that's his skill as an actor or is just that he identifies with him. Yeah, a lot. Um, I agree. It's, it's it's very good, and uh, obviously, yeah, Brendan Fraser does a great job here, and you know. Obviously, was it exactly the way like it was from the comic? No, but it had the the exact tone it needed to have, and enough. You know, the the big final confrontation was there, which was, you know, like that was the deal breaker for me. If they had screwed that up, I would have been very upset about that Absolutely. because it, it's so important. And uh, Marcus Dalzine, to his credit, nailed it in the script. So. Yeah. Um, even Absolutely. though, like, yeah, even though, yeah, Penny Farthing's kind of substituted for Driver Eight, um, the gist is here. Every, all the ma- it hits all the major points with me, and so I give it a ten. Absolutely, good. Yeah, good job. So well done, Doom Patrol. My yes. favorite episode of the series so far. Good. Love and it. hey, we have not a little casting news. Yes. Not minor casting news. We have. <laughs> Casting news yes. for Titan Talk. Exactly. This is a kind of a big one. Yeah, for yeah. Titan Season 2. 
Um, and it's all, it's kind of very appropriate to uh, talk about this on Game of Thrones Day. So happy yes. Game of Thrones Day, everybody. I'm wearing my cast of uh, – Clash of Kings. Yeah, the um, – Oh, I yeah, can't see yeah. it here with your microphone yeah. in the way. Yeah, it is uh, my cast. There you go, a cast of kings, yeah. yeah the, uh, not the podcast I'm on, but one of my favorite uh, – Podcast, Game you know, Game through podcast, yeah. So, yep. yeah, very good. I, I am excited. Yeah, this is a, obviously we're, we're very excited here in the Skaggs household, ready to to uh, watch um, Game of Thrones, the final season debuts tonight. So, series season eight. So, can't wait. Yes, it's going to be good. So, uh, obviously, this is not a Game of Thrones podcast, so we'll just kind of move on. But yes, wanted to acknowledge that because we're going to talk Ian Glenn. Who uh, obviously you know from playing um, Sir Jorah Mormont on Game of Thrones. So that's kind of the connection I was going with here. Uh, Titan season two has cast Ian Glenn or Ian Glenn as an older Bruce Wayne, which I think is really interesting. And so, Jesse, what do you think about this casting before I get into the the nitty gritty of it? I loved it. I, I first off, this guy's a great actor. Yeah, um, he's yes. done so much in Game of Thrones. And the other idea is to have an older Bruce Wayne that um, is in, – in, so interacting is, is just perfect. Um, you know, I, I don't know how much we're going to see him as Batman. Are we going to mostly see him I don't as, think so. I don't think we'll see yeah, him Yeah, I Batman. think it was – and I'm okay with that. I think right. that's actually a good choice. He might look um, a little silly wearing the Batman costume. Yeah, well, and we don't need that. We've had a Batman. Right. But to see a, a, a Bruce Wayne interacting with um, Jason Todd and, and Dick, Grace, Dick, Dick Grayson, Grayson is just – yeah. You know, so, I, I can't – I want that a lot. So we had talked about when we were talk, reviewing Titans, we had talked about how frustrated we were because yes. Bruce Wayne was either in the shadows or he was kind of blurred out in the background, not really directly talking with young Jason or young Dick Grayson. Right. You know, now we finally get to have that. Yeah, and, and I think and so, that's going to so, be so that, good. That fixes one of the problems we had with Titan Season 1. I agree. And uh, I think it's going to be a big step. And Glenn, um, so well, first I should talk about, okay, so this version of Bruce is described as, quote, after decades of fighting crime as Batman, billionaire Bruce Wayne is just as driven to protect Gotham from evil as he was in his prime. Needing to re reconcile his relationship with Dick Grayson, the du duo hopes to forge a new dynamic as Bruce tries to help his former sidekick and the Titans achieve success. Nice. So maybe Bruce is one of the reasons that um, you know maybe once he gets past his uh, being controlled by Trigon, that mm -hmm. uh, maybe he kind of helps uh, Dick get the Titans up and running officially. Yeah, I hope so. Maybe he I, you supports know. the Titans finance. It gives him a headquarters or something, or at yeah, least I realizes agree. that uh, you know maybe he's getting older and he kind of needs Dick to step up to the plate a little more. Whether yeah, he whether he admits it or not, because it's, yes. it's Bruce, he probably won't admit it. Yeah. But maybe he's maybe the, he'll hint that that's mm -hmm. the case. Yeah. Perfect. And so Glenn's fifty seven, which kind of makes him the oldest actor to portray. Bruce Wayne or Batman in live action. Um, this is after Adam West, who last played the character in two Legends of Superhero specials at 50. And that was uh, back in the 70s. Mm -hmm. And then Ben Affleck, who last appeared in Justice League at 44. And then Mike, Michael Keaton, who last played the character in Batman Returns at 40. So he's the oldest or will be the oldest. Nice. And obviously, in addition to Game of Thrones, you probably know him because we talked about – uh, well, maybe we haven't because we haven't reviewed these episodes on Next Stop Everywhere, but he's been on Doctor Who as a character named Father Octavian in the Matt Smith episodes, The Time of Angels and Flesh and Stone. That's right. He did. In, in uh, Doctor Who Series 5 from 2010. He's also been in various Resident Evil movies. He was in Kingdom of Heaven, The Iron Lady, Gorillas in the Mist, Kick-Ass 2 – Lara Croft, Tomb Raider, and My Cousin Rachel. 
Can you turn and on the for me, LJ? And TV, he's been on Don, Down the Abbey, uh, Ripper Street, Law and Order UK, other shows. So yeah, looking forward to it. Yeah, he's a great actor, and I think I'm really looking forward to see what he does as Bruce Wayne. Yep, should be good. So good. Um, we don't have any Tell It to Titan talk this week. Holly from Wisconsin apparently taking the week off. So uh, Holly, uh, hopefully you come back next week. I was yes. hoping. To hear- I would love to know your thoughts on this episode. So Absolutely. Hopefully you'll share those, but uh, if not, no big deal. But I uh, didn't get your email. So, uh, uh, But if you want to be like Holly usually is and you want to reach us here at Titan Talk, you can reach us at titantalkcast at gmail.com. That's titantalkcast at gmail.com. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, or the, otherwise, you can reach us at titantalkcast on Twitter or Titan Talk, the Titans podcast on facebook we definitely appreciate that and uh, also please go to itunes rate and review us we would definitely appreciate that as well and if you could like and follow us and share us with uh your people on the social media that would be great absolutely and jesse where can they reach you on the interwebs so i am available on twitter at jesse jackson dfw uh i am also on facebook at jesse jackson in Louisville, texas you can hear me talk doctor who um, me or other guest yes. um, guest hosts um, for our Charles and I's Next Stop Everywhere, the Doctor Who podcast. And I am coming up this first this uh, this week. We will record um, our first review of the current season of Game of Thrones on Small Council Matters. That's yeah. on the Tuning Into Sci Fi TV network. And of course, please, I'm please fin- check that out. Yes, I am finishing up my uh, 40 days of Springsteen. Um, this is the last week. Uh, we have a lot of guest hosts that are doing their moment, and uh, then after Easter, we'll get back to our once a week episode, just talking to fans. And Charles, how about you? Where can they hear your great work? Well, I don't know about great, but you can oh, hear my – Oh, very great. Yeah, my – you can hear me um, – uh, well, first, actually, I should say that you can follow me on the Twitter machine at Charles Skaggs or on Instagram at Charles Skaggs or Facebook at Charles Skaggs in Hilliard, Ohio. Definitely appreciate that. Say hi. Uh, other than that, you can reach me on my blog of geeky things. Get that button to work. Damn good coffee. And hot Damn good coffee and hot, where I talk about all the stuff we talk about here on Titan Talk, including any calls, uh, comic book, sci-fi, casting news, um, including the uh, the Ian Glenn casting on Titans as Bruce Wayne uh, recently. Uh, all kinds of news about, like I just recently posted about Disney Plus, their big announcement, and all their shows coming up. And so check that out if you would. My and uh, also has news of my podcast. That I do for Southgate Media, including the aforementioned Next Stop Everywhere, the Doctor Who podcast, where Jesse and I are going to talk dialect here in a couple weeks, and uh, from the Christopher Eccleston era. Absolutely. But, uh, we've been talking. I had a lot of great cast hosts, guest hosts, including um, Christine Peruski and Zan Sprouse, who is my co-host on Ghostwood, the Twin Peaks podcast that I do with her, where we talk about all things Twin Peaks, David Lynch, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah, and Christine is one of the members with me on the Small Council Matters. Right. Uh, So if you like Christine's uh, visits on the um, Next Stop Everywhere, check her out. She is wonderful on uh, Small Council. Yeah, she always does a nice job on Next Stop Everywhere. Yeah, she is. She is a really good. Yeah, we had a lot of fun talking. A good man goes to war recently. So Uh, next time on Titan Talk, uh, we are going to talk Hair Patrol. In episode 10, our two-thirds, as we hit the two-thirds mark, where Vic and Rita face a dangerous man called the Beard Hunter. And this is a very um, silly character that from Doom Patrol number 45 of Grant Morrison's run, that's essentially like a parody of the Punisher. And only, you know, taking a serious, silly, um, uh, a silly take on it because essentially this Instead of the Punisher hunting criminals, the Beard Hunter hunts men with beards and takes their beards as trophies. So wow. apparently apparently here the Beard Hunter has been 
activated by the Bureau of Normalcy to find Niles Calder. Okay. So we'll see what happens. Nice. And so maybe this will be the backstory that mm-hmm. uh, of revealing what happened to the lab equipment. We'll find out. Okay. Very nice. I'm Stay looking tuned. forward to it. Yes. So that's next week. Uh, so we'll see what happens. So if you want to brush up on the Beard Hunter, you probably should read Doom Patrol number 45. Good. Check that out. So otherwise, thanks to everybody for listening. Um, and uh, come on back. We're going to talk Hair Patrol next time. And uh, we'll see you right here next time on Titan Talk, the Titans podcast. Goodbye, everybody. 